Sandy, there are some subtle differences in these trials, and, and let me just see if I can summarize a, a couple of those. Um, imaging evaluations were not standard across all the trials. Some of them were investigator evaluated, some of them were independently reviewed. Um, mm -hmm. Doses and schedules were a bit different across the, across the drugs, which may or may not have an effect. Uh, presented at the ASCO 2017 meetings as an interesting observation in the PROTECT trial, where patients that got full doses had a significant benefit with respect to disease-free survival as compared to the overall trial. Uh, as Michael points out, where, where oftentimes doses needed to be reduced because of tolerance to therapy. Um, how are we going to, you know, and, and also the populations. Um, you know, when we generated the UCLA Integrated Staging System in 2002 and, and published it, um, we still don't have a good way of knowing how to pick out the poorest prognosis patients with high-risk resected disease. And I know at the, at the ASCO 2017 meetings, there's actually a, an Escudier presentation that talks about a gene signature that's been validated based upon some work from Brian Reaney. So how are you, how are you putting this together and, and, and on the heels of not only evaluation of targeted therapy in this space, but the knowledge that right around the corner we're going to be asking in hundreds if not thousands of patients the role of IO therapies in this space? What are your thoughts? So I think we really have to go back to what do we uh, include for risk assessment, right? Who And you spoke about the UCLA uh, system, but there is uh, the Catan nomogram. There is the Mayo Clinic's assessment. A lot of things are taken into consideration, size of tumor, vascular invasion, presence or absence of necrosis, the TNM stage. And if you actually take each of this, take a same patient and try to apply that to these three, three groups, you get a different um, risk assessment. So I think it really comes down to some level of harmonization as to what do we even consider as high risk. That's the first thing. And each of these trials, I mean, Assure had a different assessment. Um, Protect has a different one, and I think source is different. So each of the trials that, that we have today have a different inclusion of who the patient is in. So I think the first step as we start thinking about how to interpret these trials and maybe as we get ready for I.O. would be really getting some clarity about which assessment are we going to use to get these patients enrolled. So Ty, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will. Um, so a patient comes into your office. In, in Arizona, they've just had a T3 lesion resected. You've done imaging, and they have no evidence of advanced disease. Um, what's your con what's the conversation going to be like? Yeah, so I, I I agree with Sandy. You know, one of the things is how do we better define what's considered high risk? I like the Mayo Sign score. I like the UCLA. Uh, scoring because these are things that you could pull off a pathology report. You don't need fancy DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing. You don't have to have the patient pay extra money because this is information that our pathologists have provided to us for free. So I look at that and I also break down. So for instance, I use a sign score and I break it out into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. So I define low risk as a sign score of zero to three. These patients, historically, when you follow them out over 20 years, at 15 years, greater than 90% of those patients with sign score zero to three will still be alive. If you look at the high risk, these are patients with a sign score greater than eight. At 15 years, only six to 7% of them will be alive. So I use that sign score first to figure out where that patient falls into. The other thing that I'm also looking for is, is there a patient who has a small tumor but could conversely die of their disease? And this is where a lot of our research is actually uh, focused on, particularly with the BAP1 mutation. So when we break it up, the patients by these different sign score uh, stratifications, we can actually identify patients who have small tumors but have a higher risk of dying of their disease. In some cases with BAP1, they're three times as likely to die of their disease as having a BAP1 uh, wild type. So taking that into effect, I kind of discuss with the patient, and we, we do offer them molecular profiling to give them a sense of how long we should surveil them, the frequency of surveillance, and it's tailored to the molecular profiling in combination with the clinical pathologic characteristics. And have you found in your patients that some accept adjuvant targeted therapy, or, or is your recommendation obviously to put them on a trial first, 
but absent a trial availability? Or are you offering that to your, your patients? You know, I'm very upfront with them. I always tell them that, you know, we didn't find that patients live longer as a result of being on these therapies. You have to be on these therapies for a year. Uh, and that's difficult for a lot of them because if you think about the other solid tumors, adjuvant therapies usually last about six months. This is a whole year. And it's a, it's a significant uh, life cost to them to take some of these medications. So a lot of them, I present them the data, but most of them knowing that they don't think they're going to live longer as a result, they would like to have the molecular profiling, but they choose not to pursue um, targeted therapy unless it's part of a clinical trial. Well, that's very helpful. Martin, your thoughts on this? I think the lowering question that has come up now a couple of times in everyone's thought is whether in the future we will be adding any type of molecular testing to help stratify these patients. And it's been done successfully in other cancers. Many community oncologists use the Oncotype DX assay regularly for patients with breast cancer to make decisions on adjuvant therapy, yes or no. Uh, and there is some data that you alluded to before that um, that tries to take that same approach in kidney cancer now. So the Cleveland Clinic Group had a um, publication several years back uh, where they looked at non-metastatic disease and the likelihood of disease recurrence based on a 16-gene score uh, that is uh, RNA-based. And what they found, and that it was subsequently uh, um, validated by an independent European data set, was that independent of the T-stage, molecular information can help predict the likelihood of recurrence to some extent, meaning exactly what Ty said before, just like BAP1 can identify some patients with small tumors that have a higher likelihood of recurrence, the 16 gene score can do the same. And those uh, investigators have now taken things a, st a step further, and Bernard Escudia has an abstract at ASCO 2017 where he tries to apply that knowledge now on the extract data set. Meaning, if we look at patients treated with sonitinib in the adjuvant setting versus those that receive placebo, uh, is there any useful information in the 16-gene score helping us determine who are the patients that may or may not benefit? Now, what we can gather from the abstract, uh, we can see both for sonitinib and placebo-treated patients that the gene score helps uh, understand who is at higher and lower risk uh, of recurring. What we don't know from the abstract is whether it helps with treatment decision making. Are there patients who we clearly think should have uh, sonitinib therapy based on this or not? And this may all go back to what uh, Michael mentioned before. Clear cell kidney cancer universally is driven by loss of EHL, upregulation of HIF, and uh, you know, active VEGF signaling. So maybe for this class of agent, a molecular test is not going to be so helpful to stratify things. Uh, but we are now thinking about target immunotherapy in the perioperative space, and there might be a bigger difference there. We don't have that signal yet in the metastatic setting, uh, but we are going to investigate that further, and we should uh, apply what we learned in the metastatic setting quickly to the perioperative trials, because that was a shortcoming of how the targeted therapies were tested in the perioperative space, partly because the technology wasn't available, but now, really, there's no excuse to not do it. We have NGS available to us, and there are many strategies to look into the tumor microenvironment. We should do that as we test IO agents in the perioperative setting.